When I talk about influences, I'm sure a lot of people assume I took most of my inspiration from people like Digibro or The Procrastinators, and that I based a lot of my otaku personality off Harunobu Madarame and Katsuragi Keima, but that's only half the story. I waited so long to tell this story here because I didn't know really how to approach it properly. This is ultimately about me making good on a question my 5th grade teacher indirectly asked me that has been eating away at me for the past 14 years. Answering that question will necessitate me finally explaining the first of two untold stories that played an instrumental role in my university saga that I haven't talked about before. This is a semi-scripted story about the man who changed my life. When I was in elementary school, we were given an assignment to read a book and make a presentation about our role model. This was one of the first school assignments I recall that really troubled me, not because it was particularly difficult, but because I didn't have a role model. I remember racking my brain trying to sift through my limited life experiences to see if there was a name I could use that actually meant something to me. We were supposed to tell our teacher who we wanted to research by the end of the week and she would write the names on the chalkboard so there would be no duplicate presentations. Come Friday, I was more confused than I was when I started, so I settled on a semi-popular athlete that I remember my dad talking about fondly. The person I researched was a good guy both on and off the field, but I never felt a real connection to. To me, he was just a good person, and I could clearly see that he was an upstanding individual whom I respected, but not someone I necessarily felt a strong connection to. I didn't want to become like this person. I didn't have a poster of this guy in the back of my bedroom door, nor did I think about them much before or after this assignment. This assignment made me feel like a dirty liar. For a considerable amount of time after this, I carried with me this adolescent stressor in the back of my mind that slowly ate away at me. It sounds pathetic letting some elementary school assignment trouble me for so long, but I started to think of it more as a prescription of something far greater with me that I needed to address. I mean, it was a simple question, who is your role model? That innocent question and my inability to confidently answer it made me wonder if anyone in the world mattered to me at all. It dragged forth the concept of existentialism and dropped it at the feet of my 15-year-old self, asking me difficult questions about what I would become and what in life even mattered. This childhood stressor foreshadowed my darkest days of high school and it almost destroyed me. No name I brought forth could hold up to scrutiny. That's because my role model doesn't have a name. I don't know if he exists. All I know is that he was a person around the same age as me and our fates intersected just long enough for him to wordlessly leave a lasting impression on me that dramatically altered the trajectory of my life from then on. The first time I saw this person was August 2017 during freshman orientation for the Department of Applied Science and Technology at my university. It was the last day of summer and the weather was unrelentingly hot. The short trek from my dormitory to the event building was more than enough to make me break into a sweat like I had just finished sprinting a distance five times as long. The reason I noticed this disheveled long-haired guy was because he was sitting in the far left corner of the room wearing dark jeans and a black hoodie with headphones hung around his neck. He stuck out to anyone walking in. I was initially bewildered that any sane person would choose to wear a hoodie on one of the hottest days of August. I took a random seat as the presentations began. The professors talked about how great the program was and how much we were going to learn and how it was going to prepare us for all the wonderful jobs we can get out there when we graduated. Though all the while, I couldn't stop thinking about this dude wearing a hoodie and jeans. Surely he was hot, right? I mean... Why subject yourself to needless heat and not dress for the weather? It only occurred to me later that night, but the answer was clear. He was wearing a hoodie and jeans because he was remaining loyal to himself. That's precisely the reason why he also had the over-ear headphones draped around his neck. Before I knew it, I was on Amazon buying some on-ear headphones to wear on my commutes so I can hang around my neck while I stare out the windows in class like some anime protagonist. A glimpse to the full context of his narrative unfolding would never quite be made clear to me, but... This was without a doubt his reasoning. You wear a hoodie in the summer if you're trying to prove something. You're not trying to show off to others that you can withstand the heat. Rather, that you won't let the environmental factors sway your persona. He was a person who wore a hoodie. No matter what the weather, this was what he wore. And by the time next summer came around, I was intentionally doing the same thing. I developed a uniform and stubbornly stuck to it regardless of temperature. It was like I was spiting everyone around me, because through these clothes, I was expressing how different I was. 
I know I was reading into this probably way more than a normal person would, but if you're also a fellow hoodie and a summer wearing individual, and I know you're out there, I suspect you also have some suppressed tunibio reason as to why you wear it. Yeah, going into air conditioned rooms can get really chilly regardless of the outside weather, but the real reason we wear hoodie and jeans in the summer is to express something a little bit more complex that is difficult to explain without looking and sounding dumb to anyone on the outside listening in. It's the same reason why people wear shorts in the winter or uncomfortable sneakers when walking around on vacation all day. These are calculated expressions of one's individuality, or at the very least, one's desire to maintain a specific aesthetic and stubbornly stick to it. The second time I saw this guy was during the first actual week of classes. We both attended a general education class about biology in a rather large lecture hall with over a hundred other students. One day as everyone was filing out of the narrow seating rows after class, I saw this guy from across the aisle. The moment that would follow is forever burned into my memories. There he was, long hair covering half his face, hoodie on and messenger bag covered with pins slung over one shoulder. But what caught my attention was his shirt. He had a shirt with about a hundred anime girls on it with text that read, No waifu, no laifu. I mean it with the utmost sincerity when I say this, but the following few seconds comprise perhaps the most important moment in my entire life. After that encounter, I was never the same again. It goes without saying that I wasn't always an outgoing otaku. For a long time, I was trying to bury my personality behind layers of irony. There was a time when I truly cared about hiding my power levels and went out of my way to not let anyone know that I was into this otaku stuff. That moment after a random lecture in 2017 was so significant because it was the moment the pendulum began to swing the other way. This guy in his dumb t-shirt unintentionally proved to me how glorious it was to see someone else out there proudly displaying their anime hobbies for all the world to see. He made me suddenly feel naked in my plain t-shirt and shorts. Everything I knew about cringe was forgotten. My mind was completely shattered in an instant under the weight of the onslaught of existential thoughts. What was I even doing? What was I even trying to pull here? Why was I trying so hard to look like the people I hated? I was so impressed by the balls this guy had to wear this shirt like that, regardless of if it was ironic or sincere, because the message was clear. He was a fellow true otaku that was seemingly so much more comfortable than his own skin and could express this fact to the world. These were only my impartial observations though. I had this character I had begun to build in my head about this guy and I like to believe that this person was as cool as how he presented himself. After that day, I didn't see him show up to class again except for exams. It wasn't the last time I saw this guy, but I now realize it might have been the best chance I would ever have to speak with him. A few weeks later, I saw him at Anime Club. I had begun fruitlessly attending the club for about a month at that point, trying to convince myself that it was worthwhile. Every week, the club would meet in a vacant auditorium and watch anime for a couple hours. It quickly became obvious to me that the club was not someplace I belonged. I stopped attending after holding out for two months and realized that nothing they were going to watch was something I hadn't already seen before. It just so happened that a few meetings before I quit the club was one of the only days my long-haired senpai decided to show up. It seemed obvious that he would go considering the proud display of his otaku pride and the few moments I had seen him, but this moment surprised me regardless. Though what caught me off guard was that he was with a girl that day. I think they were more than just friends. She was like a displaced deviant art emo straight out of 2009. If he was alone that day, maybe I would have gone up to him and said, Oh, how lucky! Awkwardly, and we would have shared a laugh or two. Instead, I sat in the top row and kept to myself. The fact that he was there with a girl caused me a great deal of trouble. My mental image of him grew distorted and I didn't know how faithful he was to the image I was building in my head. Maybe these reservations manifested in my reluctance to ultimately approach him, but I was probably just too shy for my own good. This guy was like my Don-san and I was Digibro. He was the one reading the Lucky Star Dojinshi in class and all I needed was to acknowledge our shared insanity and a connection would be established. But I never said anything to him. We continued living our separate lives, but I never forgot about him and what he represented. It was because I saw this guy whose appearance reminded me of Digibro that I decided to open back up to the idea of exploring the After Dark channel's content again. There was a while after Digi's drunken vlog that I had a falling out with their content and didn't touch it for a few months after. If I never saw this guy, I would probably have never returned to the Procrastinators podcast, never listened to the decompression chamber, and forgotten about insomnia analysis. Without these touchstones in my life, I wouldn't be half the man I am now. This guy's existence influenced me to watch Lucky Star during November 2017 and have that anime radically alter the trajectory of my otaku lifestyle in a time when I was getting back into anime stronger than I had ever been before. 
After I saw both this guy and Digibro with the unmistakably hippie geek long hair, I started to grow my hair out too. I wore my hoodies more and bought those on-ear headphones to wear around my neck like a JRPG protagonist. I wanted to be like this guy because he seemed like such a perfect representation of everything I wasn't confident enough to be, and seeing this existence before me made it feel more attainable, flipping a switch in me that changed my life forever. It was now the very end of April in 2021 and one of the last days of my last years in university. Almost all my classes were meeting exclusively online or had already ended after a final exam. I was walking back to my apartment after working a few hours at my on-campus job. It had been raining earlier that afternoon so the clouds still hung heavy and water still collected into puddles on the sidewalk. Above the sun was only just peeking through the clouds right before setting, contrasting the dark sky with light orange and purple hues. Not a single other person was around after the rain, and the area was entirely deserted. This moment of Silent Hill-esque isolation enveloped me. I had my hood up and was listening to Shinigiwa Satellite on my headphones. At this point, I was already caught up in my own nostalgia for a time when I started this school. I was almost done. I didn't know what was going to happen to me next. I was on the precipice of really entering adulthood for the first time, and the bittersweet end to my peaceful university days was finally sinking in. The melancholic half-smile of Genshi Ken's graduation chapter echoed my own somber reminiscing, but my memories were only of me. I had no friends, no connections, nothing except my little one-bedroom apartment and the hundreds of anime I watched in there. My thoughts were interrupted, though. I saw another person. It was an unmistakable figure with long flowing hair, over-ear headphones on and a ready messenger bag with hundred anime pins slung over their shoulder. He was cutting across the street perpendicular to where I was. Without thinking about it, I made a sharp left and cut through the parking garage to take a shortcut. My gentle stroll turned into a run and I was twisting through the empty rows where vehicles used to park. At the end of the garage, I emerged at the intersection and I saw my old senpai on the other side of the street, reunited briefly for one last time. During the second and third years, I didn't see him again. We never crossed paths and we were like ships in the night. But here, at dusk on the last day of school, I had one chance. I bit my tongue. I caught my hand mid-wave. All of a sudden, the gravity of the moment lodged the yet unformed words in my throat. I didn't know his name or even who he was. Who would I call out to? What can I say to someone who meant so much to me yet represented a dream so vague? For all I know, he didn't care about anime anymore. Maybe he never cared and it was all a joke. Maybe he had a girlfriend and he never was the person I wanted him to be. In a moment of instinctual social awkwardness, I could only muster up the courage to take my phone out and snap a blurry photograph. I don't know what compelled me to do that, but I at least now could understand why no words came to me that day. In the end, I watched him walk off and our paths remained uncrossed. I continued onward home as he went off to a place I would never know. I never saw him again after that. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever run into him again at an anime convention or bookstore, but even if I did, I'm content with leaving this Akogare no Senpai-esque relationship as is. I ended up letting him live on as a concept. It was more beneficial for this guy to only exist in my head as this idol that would always be one step ahead of me, someone who I could look up to and keep trying to be the best otaku I can be, knowing that there's someone else out there really just doing the same. In that final moment, and all the moments in between, I secretly feared having that illusion destroyed. Hence why I let him walk off into the fading dusk. He became a model for and continues to be my ideological warrior. This guy whose name I never knew changed my life without us ever meeting.